Hey, is there any agenda changes or conflicts of interest on tonight's agenda for any member of council? I will make a motion then. A motion to approve the consent agenda. I would second that. All those in favor say aye. No. Aye. Any opposed? Yeah. Can we go back to citizens before council now? Yep. <clears throat> is there any citizen appearing that would like to appear before council on any items not on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, we'll start a regular agenda. Item number eight, community broadband update. One moment. <laughs> Good evening, Council. Um, we were going to do this once we were almost done, uh, but we thought we'd just bring it in since it's budget season. We want to go over this. Uh, you'll see broadband budget here soon. Um, and I will keep this as short as humanly possible. Um, what you have in front of you is a quick slide of the 2020 costs so far, uh, 2020 actuals, 2022 pro forma, and the variance between the two. Um, right now, this is only through August. So we did do the first uh, eight months of the year. So if we can get those actuals, and then we took the pro forma and took it back to the same time frame, so you'd have relativity between the two. Um, right now, we are under revenue by $258,000, which was kind of anticipated. We could only do so many drops at a time. Um, as Marco knows, that some are very difficult, some are very easy uh, kind of thing. Uh, but we're on pace right now to hit about a million dollars in revenue this year, uh, which is pretty significant for us. The good portion is, is the OPEX. Um, we're at $849,000. We were anticipated to be at $1.1 million. So we're $258,000 less in revenue, but we haven't spent $270,000 in costs. And then you go on CapEx, we're actually $800,000 under budget there. So we're a little over a million dollars under budget, which is great. Uh, revenue will catch up at some point once we can get everybody on that wants to be on. Um, and when I bring up a map here in a minute, because that'll be your most interesting portion of the questions, I'm sure, is we'll show you where, what we have done, where we're at, um, and how much farther we have to go. Questions on this slide? Uh, basically, this is the, the same slide, just with a little bit more breakdown in it of staffing, uh, elsewhere, debt services, million dollars, uh, total CapEx. Uh, this is the actual, this is what's budgeted. So we've only spent 1 million out of 1.9 and 863 out of the 2.79 for the budget for the year. So we're significantly under budget. Um, working with Lightworks, who's doing all of the installations for us, has been amazing. Uh, last year, we just rolled over the PO. Uh, they didn't ask for any more money. They just said they keep working at their same rate, the same cost. We just rolled the PO over, and they haven't even hit gotten close to hitting the final fee on that PO either. We don't anticipate them to. So uh, at the end of the day, the installation cost through Lightworks uh, is going to be hopefully uh, knock on wood, uh, significantly less than we had anticipated it to be. And they put a proposal out there. Matt, before you move on, why? I'm not complaining that we're under budget for expenditures, but why that's a significant, almost half of what we expected. What, why is that? Just, just at this point, everything's been going fairly smoothly. Uh, you know, they're, they have to take a risk. They gave us a proposal at the beginning of the project for a five-year project. And basically, we narrowed it down to two years and said, let's get it all done. So... At this moment, we're, we're under budget because they're, the project is going better than they would have anticipated it to. And it's not a fixed fee project. It's a, a time and materials and bill against the PO. When we get close to it, we talk about where we're at percentage wise. And they've always been but construction that's wise. Right? That's capital costs. It's not about operating costs. Well, your operating costs, half of what we're We haven't hired everybody. <laughs> that answers the question. So we're not up and running. There'll be some more costs this year. There's some more equipment to put in as we add. Uh, areas we start maxing out how much rack space we're using how many things we've plugged into that particular card we add more things to it and we continue on that way and we haven't hired everybody at this point the the staffing for broadband was actually pretty expansive at the end of it and we're trying to minimize that all the way up until the revenues meet it uh, so we're working on as every other department in the city of Glen Springs is, is on minimal staff to accomplish maximum amount of output and we're doing really well at that at this moment how many, how many subscribers do we have? 
It was between five and 600 at this moment. So we'd, we'd like to be in the thousand range <laughs> uh, as soon as possible. Um, what you're seeing here is basically a spreadsheet. So I'm gonna flip the other page real quick. So we broke the entire city into this map. You guys have seen this map before. It's kind of chunked out, it's all different colors. Um, but we broke the city into this map and the spreadsheet correlates with every area within that map. So everything that's in the green, as you can see, is the OSP is complete. We're basically up, we're running. Um, um, we may have some testing to do in a couple of these areas before we turn it on live, because we don't want to turn it on live and then have it fail. So there's a few of these areas that are actually, all the construction is done, we're just doing our testing at the moment. Uh, yellow is under construction. And we flip to the map here in a second. Purple is pre-construction. That means we're going to go in the crews go in before they ever start pulling any wire or even thinking about what the actual design says. They go in and rod and rope every single piece of conduit, make sure the pathways are what they're supposed to be. We have found in some cases the pathways didn't exist or didn't route the way we thought they were going to because all of this was based off the electrical maps when we started. And we've, we're improving our electrical maps thanks to this um, because we're actually GISing all of this stuff in fiber will be in its own GIS. Um, but that's what purple is. So we're working on the pre-construction for that. So that makes the construction much faster. Uh, blue is not started and red is hold or redesign. So basically they went into the area, they were doing the purple operations and said, whoa, none of this is even close to what it was supposed to be. We stop, give them the, give the designer the information, they redesign the entire thing. But you can see it's only lats. It's basically the trailer part. Um, very complicated, not a whole lot of underground conduits, those kind of things available, there'll be a lot of boring in there. So we're reassessing that area to make sure that when we start, it's efficient when we start. Uh, and here <laughs> is the map. There's a lot of green areas, obviously. Um, the blue areas we haven't started at all are kind of right here. And there's a couple over here. They're not huge volume areas. We're talking about a hillside that has like two houses on it. We're talking about Deborah's house. We're gonna wait until the last, <laughs> you know, Hager Lane is a complicated area because there's a lot of direct berry in there, not so much conduit. So it's the areas that are super complicated that we're kind of holding off on. Um, <clears throat> and you'll see some blank areas um, like the downtown area. The downtown area is already fed by fiber. It's the old legacy system that is there. It's still functioning. We're leaving it alone. We'll start transferring it over. But in essence, that area is served. We're not adding customers to it currently, but when we replace all the fiber in there, then we'll start adding customers to it. When will that happen? Be in one of those downtown people. One of those downtown people. So the intent is to get the main build out of everything done by the end of basically November. And then we'll start kind of piecemealing things in because like we can say we're done with an area, but there may be three large residential units with 50 units within those, like an apartment complex. Okay, we're done with the area, but now we got to figure out how to serve you. How do we get there? How do we get into the mechanical room? How do we get up to the units? Those kinds of fun things. So we're always, we're going to be working on this for a long, long time. But the main build out should be done by the end of November. We were shooting for the end of October. Delays happen. It'll be the end of November kind of thing. So soon we'll be able to get to Paula. <laughs> so I know it's always the question. Is not not <laughs> when are you going to get to my house is always the question. But at this point, we're looking at the end of November. And then we'll start piecemealing all those little things back in uh, as we go. Um, we are the main suppliers, I believe, at Bell Rippy, uh, the main one over at Walmart. So we've been trying to also focus on those things. So as things come in like BLD, we're talking to them because that's 300 easy units for us. Lofts didn't work out for us. They're a Comcast customer. But as things come in, we're having these conversations up front so that when you build it, you put the conduit in the ground and you know, mechanically speaking, within the building that everything can be pulled. So there's a lot of those little parts and pieces that Michael and his crew work on very, very well um, while the construction crews are putting fiber in the ground. So that is it. I was trying to Lofts keep it short. A Comcast customer. So if I was in Lofts, I couldn't get in the city broadband. <clears throat> No, Six Canyons is a is a dual unit. I believe it's CenturyLink and us. There's some complications in each one of these things, legally speaking. But <laughs> but a lot of these are big corporations that build these things, and they already have somebody that they normally work with. So, but we try to get in wherever we possibly can. No, a quick question. I've heard some comments from people along Midland um, on the um, 
closer to the downtown area that have problems getting any kind of internet? Is this going to help them kind of resolve that problem? Yes. Uh, one of the people was like, I can't get anything absolutely from anybody. And, and so I was saying, well, city broadband's coming your way. Just hoping that. Yeah. And the nice thing is, is when, I don't understand it. I'm not going to point out any names. We have people that come in or actually, sorry, let me take that. We have people that were watch, pay other companies huge amounts of money put a cable from point A to point B. And we already have those costs basically built in as an, a, an expendable cost that we'll re, get reimbursed later as people continue on with the service. And people still do it. But for somebody like that, they probably have Comcast or CenturyLink could be, but maybe they said it was going to be $2,000 to get the cable from point A to point B. And they're like, whoa, 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 that's, that's way too much. I think that's the benefit of CBN is we're going by basically everybody in town and we figured out a way to put a box close enough to you that we can get you a service and we don't charge to do that service drop. So yes, it will help them for sure, I okay. guess is the short answer to that. But I just, I have watched a lot of dollars go out the, the door on even some commercial businesses. I'm like, we would have done that for free and it would have taken us two days, not three weeks. <laughs> but it's a large commercial customer that every single one of their businesses has a certain user and they pay one bill. They don't want to have to pay CBN because it's a whole other check. They got. It's an interesting conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So are we able, like lofts or with Comcast, are we able to get into the lofts as well? So those residents have a choice? It's a private building. Private building. Yeah. yeah. We try. We try everywhere. Okay. Any other questions? We will see a budget. I mean, we haven't done the budget for broadband yet. That has actually been put together, um, but you'll see the budget for 2023. Significantly less CapEx. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Anybody from the Sorry. go ahead. I have a question on um how is the are we where we want to be with employees? Or are we having trouble hiring just as just like everything else right now? Uh honestly speaking, it seems if we put a broadband position out, you know, they're graded pretty high for technical capabilities. So right. maybe they're a next grade up from an equivalent thing in the city. Mm -hmm. but we haven't overly had an overly hard time hiring. Okay. other than the very highest position, which Michael is actually doing two different positions at this moment. Um, she's got the capabilities of doing, he's got the time to do it. He's, he's burning himself out pretty quick, but um, he's holding in there and he's gonna, we're gonna get this done. But we do have a very high level position that we tried to advertise for. We kind of, I hate to say it, dumbed it down a little bit and advertised it again. It was a year and a half or so. Basically nobody qualified, applied for it. Okay. And it's okay. that director, not director's position, but it's a manager's position. So you need to know a lot of technical skills and a lot of software and a lot of how everything functions. And it's, it's a tough market right now because it's a technical market currently. Right. Uh, right. So we're going to review, review that job description again and have some more conversations and probably try to put it back out in 2023 so that okay. Michael's not doing just everything. Okay. Okay. Um, the other question I had was, I think you mentioned numbers that hook up subscribers that we have. Where are we as far as projections and how are we tracking with where we thought we'd be now? So we've actually taken the pro forma and kind of dropped it down a little bit. We were shooting for 40% infiltration. We, we dropped it down to about 30% and we still function just fine. Okay. Um, we're not paying back the loan as quickly, but it's still getting paid back at the end of the day. Those kinds of fun things are happening. Um, but it brought, we brought it down to 30. And the last time I talked to Michael, we were like 19 or 20. Okay. So we're getting closer. And as we open up more of these areas, right. um, there'll be more people we'll be passing by. If we can get some of these bigger units on a unit contract um, where they're, the owner is actually paying for all of the units, it's not the tenants themselves. That's a good way to get a bulk dollar amount in, uh, even if you have to lower your price just a slight amount. Because even if the unit's not occupied, they're still paying for it. Right. And if we don't do that, then we get none of them. Okay. Just like the law. So if we don't get in and get some of these good, good deals going. Okay. But those are very, very going to be very helpful for us here in the near future. Hopefully. Are we still marketing? Uh, we do marketing spurts. Okay. And every time we do a marketing spurt, then we can't keep up with the amount of drops and people hiring on. So then we stop a little bit and then we do it again and we catch back up kind of thing. It's been working very, very well. Kaya and Michael have been doing a great job on that. And the results from it have been very, very encouraging. 
great. That makes sense. Thanks. Word of man. mouth is spectacular. Facebook, anybody wants to say something good, it, it's, it, it'll be great. <laughs> Any other questions? Matt, thank you very much. Yeah, no Appreciate it. Exciting. All right. Next up is Mind Springs. Mind Spring. That's what I said. I like um, Johnny Carson and remember the Ed McMahon. Ed McMahon with a graffiti. Oh, oh. oh. Mind Spring. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is John Sheen. I'm the new CEO for Mind Springs Health. Uh, West Springs Hospital. So we're going to be uh, bringing Elizabeth Tice and the rest of our team in to talk a little bit about our operations uh, for the new detox center that we're planning to open here in Glenwood. Um, I just wanted to spend a minute and, and kind of open and introduce myself and, uh, and, and first of all, say that I know that Mind Springs has had some, uh, we'll put it mildly, we've had some bad press uh, recently. Uh, so uh, I've been here uh, about 45 days now. Um, it's been a it's been a fulsome 45 days of getting to know everything that's going on and really getting a feel for uh, all that's going on in this community. I had a an opportunity to spend some time uh, at Bell Valley Hospital and 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 meet with those folks about uh, system of care issues and things that we're working on in terms of continuum of care and getting to know the community here. And obviously, we've got a pretty robust outpatient site and we're planning a a detox. And I just wanted to to uh, to open it up to you all to ask me any questions you'd like to ask me about. Um, you know, my background, anything, anything you're, you're interested in asking me as the, the new guy um, while we're waiting for uh, for the team to come on here. We're a little, we're, we're just about 650, so I think they're all scrambling to get on. So, Hi. Hi, my name is Tony Hershey and my other job, I work at the district attorney's office. So we deal with your office, with MindSprings a lot. Great. I know that you, you were being modest when you say that you had some bad press, but can you just talk while we're waiting a little bit about I know you've worked with the counties, you've worked with DHS, you've worked with the courts and law enforcement. What are, what are you doing to sort of right the ship, I guess would be a good phrase. I think the first thing that I've been doing to, uh, to right the ship is really to understand what are the compliance issues and what are the details of it. It's one thing to have articles written. It's another thing to actually have to say, okay, what are we, what are we doing well? What are we doing uh, not so well? And what are the real compliance issues that uh, state agencies and funders and others of our constituency. And obviously our communities have perceptions that we need to work on. So I really tried to work through, we had a tri-agency audit that we um, recently completed a corrective action plan for, and, and that was accepted by all three of the agencies that conducted that. It was uh, HICPUF, CDPHE, and, uh, and the newly formed BHA. And so we have a number of areas of compliance that were um, specifically working on to improve on over the next six months. And we're being monitored by those three agencies. Um, so, so the compliance piece is first and making sure that we, um, you know, we are doing everything the right way according to every contract and every standard uh, externally that, uh, that's required. On the, on the other side of it, um, you know, for me coming into an organization like this, and, and so my history is I, I started at Baker Health System in Tampa Bay. I was a, uh, their first VP of behavioral health. I was there for 11 years. I ran um, close to 300 inpatient beds for them, six psych ERs, and, um, and sort of built. Um, it was an 11 hospital system that came together in a JOA. It's about a $6 billion system now. Um, so I've got a lot of experience in continuum of care in how inpatient and outpatient work together, how hospital um, systems work with mental health, um, and that is changing uh, pretty rapidly. So coming into MindSprings, um, really my, my intent is to take a 50-year-old community mental health center that's operating uh, very, very similarly to the way it was founded in the 60s, right, um, and try to reinvent that model. And I've been successful in doing that. My, my last CEO position uh, like this, I, I came from Rochester, New York. I was running a, a health information exchange in Rochester uh, for last year, and I was doing some digital health work uh, for about a year prior to that. But prior to that, I was CEO for a large community mental health center ca uh, called Harbor in uh, Toledo, Ohio. And we hung up a, a, a for-profit telesite company off a hundred-year-old nonprofit in order to be able to serve a large population of folks. Um, we, had a, we had a one of the 35 health home uh, grants that were awarded under the 2703 um, Affordable Care Act uh, pilot. And so actually, um, interestingly enough, uh, you know, John Casey was a big supporter of our, our project. And we had about, had about 5,000 people in that, in that pilot, about 3,000 children. 
And so digital help is a real big way for us to increase access and improve recruitment. And so coming into MindSprings, it's really going to have to be a mix of um, what we've traditionally done in serving the communities, but then also looking to technology to help us um, really improve access, really improve performance. And then it's it's really a, qu a question of quality, right? And, and, and quality to me is not just um, uh, how well our hospital runs or how well a particular program runs. It's how well we get a patient from where we meet them, which is usually at their lowest point there in their families, right? And get them to beneficial wellness through a number of services, some of which we may not provide, right? And then how do we measure that? And how do we report that out to the constituencies that, uh, that we're responsible to? And, and right now we're not doing a great job at that. Um, that's something that I think is gonna take some time to fix um, and it's gonna require strategy and it's gonna require uh, a lot of change. And so we're just at the beginning of that um, but in terms of stabilizing the organization, really trying to make the staff feel like um, they're valued. You know, the, the, the team here uh, works very hard uh, with a very difficult population. And it's not easy to work for an employer that's been under the kind of criticism that we've been under. Right? It's, it's easy to look at the problems. It's, it's, it's not as easy to say, well, you know, there are a lot of really great things going on here that... Um, that help a lot of really needy people every day. And there's a lot of dedicated people working at MindSpring. So I really tried to spend some time um, with the team, making them feel valued and, and making sure that they have what they need uh, to maintain a good work-life balance. So, and, and I know Mr. Wilman, Mr. Mayor has a question, but I wanna just thank you for your hard work. It's important, yes. thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it, I appreciate it. So, you know, the concern I have as a member of council, I think detox is really important and I've been in the community for almost 50 years and it's it's been an on and off program for years. I think it's really important we get going with it. Uh, and I don't know any other way to ask you this than the way I'm gonna ask, so I hope you uh, will um, not be offended by my bluntness. Why should we trust you running that program for us? Well, I have a track record, right? I've been doing this a while um, and, and I've been in a number of different positions and, and I've been in a number of different positions where, um, it's usually a turnaround. Uh, it's kind of my kind of my thing. I, I've I've taken organizations that were struggling and taken them to a place where they weren't struggling anymore, and in fact they were innovating. Um, and it took me a long time to decide that I would come here. Um, I was being recruited for about six months, and I was reading the articles just like everybody else. Um, I was in a pretty cushy job in terms of uh, what I'd done in the, the past. I was running a health information exchange, had 35 employees in the states and 45 in Chennai, India, and um, you know, it was, it, it was a, a, a career change that I made during COVID just because I had been in the, my last position for about seven years and it was a very intense position. Um, but I wanted to come back to an organization like MindSprings um, because I really believe in community mental health. And I really believe that, um, and, and I've worked, just so you know, before I um, was, was running the HA, I was working for a billionaire evaluating startup digital mental health companies okay and, and and i was recruited because of my experience to do that and 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 really what i saw was digital technology has the um you know and i started a telesite company before covid and it was timely um but but the digital space has grown even further since then and watching what's happening in you know for instance headspace or be well or some of these online resources right those are those are, those are early uses of technology to improve access and quality of care, right? And so right now, um, probably one in four people that need care get it, right? And the care that they get may not be the best care. And so to expand that, we've got to figure out different ways uh, to improve access. Community mental health centers provide a layer of protection for communities, right? But they haven't necessarily been able to compete or take advantage of that technology or that capital that, that these startups are accessing, right? I have had a unique experience in my career in that I've been able to sort of bring those worlds together a little bit. And so in taking this position, my, my, my real passion is to take that, uh, that model that has a, been a frustrating model, even for me as a hospital administrator, I had a community mental health center. Uh, I ran a community mental health center. Um, I, I, I think the model needs to change dramatically and I think MindSprings is uniquely positioned as an organization because of its geographic dispersion to leverage that technology and to reinvent the community mental health center so that it not only survives, but it thrives. And that's something that I'm very passionate about. And it's something that I committed to when I came here. I signed a three-year agreement. Um, and I, and I, 
you know, I, I was very frank with the board about what I wanted to accomplish and what I would need to accomplish that. And so um, that's my that's my commitment. That's my statement to you. I think what you have to do is you have to watch what I do and then you have to watch the results. Right. And you have to hold us accountable. Um, I'm happy to, to be here anytime you need me to be here to answer questions or to, you know, to tell you, I don't know. Right. Or, or let's figure it out together. But there there is going to be a lot of change in terms of what MindSprings is doing today and what I think we're capable of doing in the future. So does that answer your question? I, I can I can elaborate. Ingrid, There's something specific well, there. That I guess my make. question was, we, we're, we're, we're talking about committing several hundred thousand dollars to this program, which is, a, as I said, is an important program. I pre appreciate you talking about your background in technology and stuff, but doing a detox, it doesn't deal with technology as much as how do we deal with the people? How do we know that that program is going to run? definitely deals, is going to have to deal with technology because here's the problem, right? This is a social model detox. Right now, every medical clearance is being done at the hospital. In order to run a detox in a community like this, you can't, you can't recruit a, a call team, right? You can't recruit a call, a call staff. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually look at going with a social model detox, but then quickly moving that to a medical model because we can do all of the... Uh, all of the clinical coverage can be done via technology, right? And that's going to be a really important part of what we do. And, and this, this organization, I think, is serving this community um, pretty well given the old tools, right? But we need to employ some new tools, and that will include the detox. And the detox will be successful, right? It's something that we're committing, committing to. It's something that as a CEO, I came in and said, this is something that we have to do. This is something we have to do right. And it will involve technology. Um, the idea that any part of healthcare today is not going to involve technology, particularly in a rural community, um, that that's just that that's just the way it is today. So, John, uh, uh, PC and Frank. Excuse me, sir. Uh, if you need to speak, would you come up and speak to the? He's just telling, he's just telling he's just that they're on. The people, the people are on. The he's just waiting, waiting for it here. Oh, I see. Okay, thanks. So you're good. You're good. So, so anyway. So that so to, so that point. So, for instance, a nurse practitioner right now um, to recruit three nurse practitioners to cover that detox twenty four seven to do medical detox would be almost impossible in this job environment in terms of having to have someone move to this community. We have to recruit them; they'd have to live here. If I recruit a virtual staff of three nurse practitioners and I have RN staffing the detox, right? We've got all of a sudden a medical detox where we had a social model detox before, right? And that's that's part of the planning for. Uh, Glenwood, and we're actually working on a project in Vale as well. So, All right. does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I think my question is beyond just repairing your relationship with the communities that you serve, what's going to be your biggest challenge in making this a success? And then, two, what can we do to support you beyond just giving you a check? Mm -hmm. I think it's access to care. So, I think it's it's understanding that every community is a community health alliance. And so all of the players in Glenwood are different than all of the players in Eagle and all of the players in Summit, right? And a lot of the criticism of MindSprings has been um, that we, we really run things out of Grand Junction and we're really not community focused, right? So a lot of what I've been trying to do is be present in every community and really start to understand the local politics of those communities and what the needs are, right? And then you know, for instance, I, you know, I know that there's a big need for children's uh, care, right, for, for access for adolescents and children uh, to receive mental health care. And so one of the early things that we've been doing is, is really starting to, to, to put numbers to what we think we would have to do to expand that access. And then we've got a recruitment plan in place where we've actually got two child psychiatrists right now that we're hopefully inking this week in, in, new, um, in new agreements so that we can start to expand that access quickly. And then I think it's a, establishing a feedback loop with the community, right? So the dollars that you're giving us are being spent on things, right? And you have the right to say, well, what are those things doing for this community? How are we improving health, right? And, and I think that's going to be the crux of the conversation I'd like to start in every community. And what that'll look like specifically for Glenwood Springs, I think will be different than Grand Junction and different than Eagle and different than Summit and different than Snowmass. So so that's the intent is really to try to have a community health alliance focus so that we're not just doing everything the way we do it in Grand Junction or or this is just a satellite of what we do in Grand Junction. That should not be 
um, you know, not only the way we're perceived, but it shouldn't be the way we operate. So does that make sense? Paula? Oh, come on. It's good to see you here. It's good to see um, Mind Springs going through this transition. Um, I've been involved in a lot of the detox conversations, especially on the funding side. <laughs> um, and some of those conversations um, have revolved around, you know, what support each community is going to provide and what the hospitals are going to provide. Mm -hmm. And when you look at this social to medical model transition, um, my understanding, and Roger, you might need to explain this to me as well, but um, the hospitals would be providing the medical as kind of an in-kind for their contribution as part of it. And is there an arrangement kind of going on when, we, when you look at that transition in the future of going from social to medical or? I think it's a question of one of the interesting things about the conversation in this community is in every other community, the hospitals do not want to do the medical clearances. Mm -hmm. um, the hospital here does not seem to be as concerned about that. My concern about that conversation, and I brought that up is, when you open a, a detox, right, you're going to get people in cabs from all kinds of, you may get people in cabs coming from Denver. Okay, that's how bad the capacity is right now. And so the medical clearances that they're doing right now based on the local community may increase and may it may become less favorable to them to continue to do that. Um, so, so as a standard across all of our operations, I want the ability for us to be able to do medical clearance on site so that we don't have to send someone away from our front door to the hospital and then have to be brought back in order for us to treat them, right? And right now, that's the way the model will work to begin, right? Right. But as we evolve it, I feel really strongly strategically that we have to look at our own clinical coverage and our own medical clearance, um, just because I think the volume is going to increase um, pretty rapidly, uh, not just for the people that live in this community, but again, I, you know, I think there's going to be a real need regionally uh, for the service. So that's the reason that I'm I'm, 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 I'm trying to anticipate that, that need. Um, and, and I think even the hospital, after we talked and I, you know, attended that meeting, I think they started to get that, you know, the medical clearances may get a little heavier than they are right now. And there may need, even, even need to be some clinical overload. So. One other second part to this question is kind of that geographical spread that I know Mind Springs has. I, I know how broad of a geography that is. Um, and obviously detox is important to this town and this county right. and we've been working in coordination well how do you see yourself splitting your time between something that needs to be done pretty quickly because of grants and that type of stuff and what else that needs to happen within your purview well, you know i'm very focused on the things that we need to get done right so there's some just do it's that um that i have to be very focused on and, and there's nothing more important right now than being intimately involved in, in as many community projects as i can so i get to know the communities and so I have a lot of, uh, you know, I have a lot of a lot of things that I'm doing, but I'm trying to really manage my time so that I'm spending a lot of time here and a lot of time on the road in the other communities, and getting work done here, you know, on other strategic things like I'm working on a strategic plan. I could do that out of Glenwood office, right? I can meet with board members. You know, we're we're fully, uh, you know, video enabled, so I can pretty much do my job from anywhere. Um, so so as I'm traveling to the sites and to the communities. You know, I'm getting work done, um, you know, organization wide and also trying again, and I believe very strongly, I'll keep saying, you'll keep hearing it from me, Community Health Alliance is the way to go, right? It, it is it is the only way that we're going to regain trust and it's the only way that we're really going to be able to provide services that are competent um, for the people that live in, in, in the community, right? They're going to they're, they're gonna need to feel like these are the things that they need, not the things that are just being offered. Right? Does that make sense? Yep. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, I have a few. I think, uh, one, thank you very much. I think Mind Springs is, is a fantastic resource. Uh, I was just speaking with somebody today who had a great experience. They had three of their family members and they just, you know, were, were treated really, really well um, with some competency and had nothing bad to say. So, um, you know, it's not all bad news. Um, There's a but, lot of really good work on that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, but, you know, I think one of the questions Charlie asked of, you know, <laughs> why should we trust you? And, you know, you said, well, trust me, um, but you've been here 45 days and, and I don't know you respectfully, right. um, but I do know, you know, my neighbors, Hans and Chloe, and I know Angela, or, uh, uh, Ken and um, Stephanie, sorry. I know I'm so well, I'm just getting tripped up here. 
So what, what are you guys going to do um, if you do this detox center? Um, will the detox center be one of the criticisms was your financials were so kind of convoluted across your whole organization that it was tough to cost segregate out. Will the detox center have its own um, cost segregation so we can see where our money's going, what, who's being treated, not necessarily who's being treated, but we need to be able to see that. And, and will we have an audit in the MOU ability to come in at any time to see where the taxpayer's money's going? Yes, I don't, I don't, I don't see any issue with that. And I actually think there's some misunderstanding in terms of the, uh, the way that was presented in the press, but I think in any program, we're able to dive on specific costs, specific funding, um, specific, you know, specific outcomes. So I have no issue uh, at all. And, and I don't think it would be a lift at all for us to show you specifically what funding was, um, was allocated to this program and, and what, what it's being used for and what the outcomes um, that are being produced by that funding are. So that, that's something I'll commit to without, without question. Yeah, I think it'd be really good for us to get periodic reports, maybe annually, on on what those outcomes are. Um, you know, it's in, have you gotten accreditation yet from the joint, joint commission? We are not joint commission accredited uh, at this point, but that is something that we're moving very rapidly towards. In fact, we've engaged um, three different consulting groups that are helping us uh, move toward that. And that's been a lot of what I've been doing in the first 30, 45 days. It's a very important thing, not only for the organization as a whole, but the hospital itself has been open for four years and it is not uh, JCO accredited and that needs to happen. That's not something uh, CMS doesn't like new hospitals to not have accreditation after four years. So that's something we're moving very rapidly toward. And what is the time frame on that? I would say that we'd be ready to accredit the entire organization within the next two years. Um, we, would have it, we would have it finished. Um, I think the hospital will go a little quicker. I'd like to have that done within the next year. Um, how many board members remain from, from a year ago? From a year ago, uh, off the top of my head, I, I think there's six that remain from, from a year ago. And then we brought on a number of new board members and, and we're going to continue to do that. There's a, a board plan to continue to recruit from, from the, I would, I would call it the, the outlying communities and make the board more representative of uh, the communities that we serve. And so okay. that's been something that, uh, that the board has been working on. And are you still under the Rocky Mountain Health Plan's corrective action plan, or and how's that going? Well, Rocky Mountain Health Plan. So, so I, I want to clarify: we have a contract with Rocky Mountain Health Plans. They're not a they're not a regulatory agency. Okay, we are under corrective action plan with three regulatory agencies. We also have a corrective action plan under our contract with Rocky Mountain Health Plans that we're working through with them, and and I believe that's going satisfactorily. So, and are you, but you're not complete with that corrective plan. I believe we are complete with it. Okay. Yeah. And, and are you competing with the corrective plan from the three agencies, state agencies? That will be ongoing uh, for a period of time while they continue to monitor us over time. I would say that that, you know, that would probably take about a year for us to exit that tri-agency plan. And Rocky was involved in that conversation as well. Okay. So, um, so they're a major funder. Um, they're a very important part of what we do. Um, but from a regulatory compliance standpoint, uh, the real important uh, players are the three agencies that that audited us, and that will that will likely take uh, about a year for us to completely exit uh, some of those uh, compliance requirements that are going to be monitored. And will that audit be made available to us when it's completed? If everything's made made available uh, publicly. I think okay. I think by state law. I'm I'm kind of new here, but I'm pretty sure by state law that is uh, is public record. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Anything else in your part? Well, we just wanted to take you through some statistics uh, that we want to report out for the community in terms of care, care to the community that we are providing. And I think you'll see us move toward this kind of a presentation where we want you to understand to your earlier question, uh, what, what care is being provided for the resources that we're receiving and we call that care to the community. And so we, we want to make sure we update it on a regular basis. So Liz Tice is our new uh, uh, chief operating officer. And I'll just turn it over to her to take you through some of the numbers and we're still evolving some of these presentations. So, uh, so bear with us, but it, I think it's, uh, it's a start. So go ahead. Hi, good evening. Thank you for allowing us to join you and um, discuss this important uh, topic. And then also just the general service delivery for um, citizens of Garfield County. I'm going to go over three presentations tonight that are um, three PDFs that show our current level of service 
um, for Garfield County residents and um, the demographics associated with the um, clients that we're serving in Garfield. Uh, the first report is going to show our outpatient um, services and our outpatient clients. Um, so to begin, we um, measure our performance on our fiscal year, which begins July 1 and ends uh, June 30th. So the first uh, metric that we'll see here is our client count um, and our year over year growth uh, was about 1% from fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 22. You'll see fiscal year 23 has a pretty sharp decline, but that's because we're only three months into that year. Um, and the fact that we already have half the number of clients we saw last year, um, while only being three months into the year is really de demonstrative of the um, increase in clients that we'll be able to serve this year. Um, we also report on the number of services to clients. So unlike the growth, in, um, in the number of clients that we were able to uh, serve in uh, last fiscal year over the prior year, we did see a decrease in the number of services. So that's indicative of either clients requiring fewer services, which is probably not the case, or um, us trying to reach more services or more clients and needing to increase our staffing so that we're um, offering the full spectrum of services to those clients. Um, as John indicated earlier, um, deploying telehealth resources is going to help not only increase access, but we are also now open for business for anybody of any payer source, where previously we were uh, limiting commercial. We won't have to do that, um, and we aren't doing that, and deployment of telehealth is going to be able to um, help us both with, uh, with both measures there. Uh, pretty consistent in terms of the service duration. Um, so the same amount of time with clients year over year. We also track um, services that are provided to clients of Garfield County that are performed in other locations. So um, the three areas that we look at are our inpatient psychiatric hospital here in Grand Junction. We also look at the detoxes that we currently operate. And we also look at our residential treatment facility. Um, we have two residential treatment facilities in Grand Junction. So in terms of inpatient, um, in fiscal year 22, we saw slightly less uh, or slightly fewer clients from Garfield County, but the bed days actually increased. Um, so one of the things that impacted us as uh, well as any hospital in um, 22 and uh, 21 actually as well, as well is COVID. So uh, we are rapidly um, improving and increasing the staffing that we have at our psych hospital so that we are allowing more clients, especially in Western Colorado, to receive inpatient psychiatric care in Western Colorado, as opposed to needing to go to Denver or the Front Range. Um, the other thing that we report on is detox admissions. So in fiscal year 2020, we still had a detox in Frisco. We no longer operate uh, that detox, so we can't report on um, clients for subsequent years, um, but we still do report on the Grand Junction detox. So in fiscal year 22, we had about 56 clients from Garfield County that uh, went to our detox in Grand Junction, um, and that amounted to 144 um, distinct bed days. So I think this is indicative, which you already know, as to uh, for the need of the detox services in um, Glenwood. And it also is indicative of something that um, John was talking about earlier, which is the regional draw of detoxes. So the, the services that will be provided um, greater than likely just Glenwood. Um, we also have two uh, residential uh, substance abuse programs. Uh, the first is Women's Recovery Center. Um, Women's Recovery Center has been operated by uh, Mind Springs Health for many, many years and is one of our uh, keystones, if you will, of our service delivery, um, both because of the outcomes for the clients that go through it and <coughs> availability um, and the access that is afforded to um, the women in Women's Recovery Center. 
So most uh, residential treatment programs do not allow <laughs> children to go with their mother um, into residential treatment. So we would have the situation where moms needing treatment would have to choose between not being with their children uh, for an extended period of time or getting treatment. Um, at Women's Recovery Center, we have a very um, healthy and robust ability to allow those children to stay with the moms um, while they're in treatment. We have extensive case management that helps um, with schooling, that helps with transportation to um, doctor's appointments. So it's really a neat program and it allows women to not only get uh, the treatment that they need, but also stay connected with their family. So in uh, last fiscal year, we had 16 admissions to the program uh, from Garfield County, totaling 342 bed days. Uh, the Circle uh, residential program is relatively new. Um, it's been operationalized for now. Uh, we're, we're starting the uh, year three. Um, Circle is for people who have co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders. Um, it's also in Grand Junction. And in fiscal year 22, we had 11 admissions from Garfield County, and that amounted to uh, 289 bed days. In terms of the demographics of the clients that we see in Garfield County, uh, we see about 53% female. Um, the majority of the clients, 75% of the clients we see are low to moderate income. Um, we see about 13.5% of our clients are uh, persons with disability. We have uh, about 26% of our clientele are Hispanic or Latino. In terms of the age population, um, right now we have uh, predominantly adults, um, but uh, following up on some of the comments earlier made by John, with some of our telehealth and access improvements, we're going to be able to serve more children. We know that there is a big demand there as well. 2.6% of, of the clients that we see in Garfield County are military service members. 62% um, are straight and, or homosexual. 31% uh, choose not to disclose. So that is the end of that presentation in terms of the services that we're providing and the demographics. I'm happy to entertain any questions, comments, or concerns. Uh, what what, uh, why did the Frisco um, detox close? Uh, we, uh, the Frisco County, um, they chose to actually take that on themselves. So they now operate the detox in Frisco. Any other questions? Yeah, that's what she said. Thank you. Thank you. The other thing I just want to mention is our entire leadership team is here. So our, our chief clinical officer, chief medical officer is on uh, is online, and our uh, Megan Navarro, who will actually be operating the detox, is uh, is online as well. So if you have any questions about the, the clinical operations or how it's going to work or anything like that, this team is here to answer any questions you have. Any further questions? Thank you very much. Great. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you all. I appreciate it. And I hope to earn your trust over time. So Thank, thank you. you for coming. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Thanks guys. And ladies. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> All right. Next up is uh, Committee Center passes for positive influence to minors. Before we move on, what's our next step with the minors? Um, we are going to have a IGA that I think has so far been at staff level um, vetted and approved around all of the communities. Um, on the agenda next this next October 3rd, no, 4th, 5th, first week in October, um, on for approval. Evening Council, uh, Brian State Parks and Recreation Director. So we had, uh, during our, our budget overview, talked a little bit about the Valley Marijuana Council um, Youth Pass Program. That was part of a $100,000 given between um, Mind Springs for mental health programs and youth prevention programs, which was uh, headed up by the community center. So council wanted to hear a little more about the program and some possible, uh, some possible uses, expand 
expansions and program ideas uh, for the future, what that looks like and, and talk a little bit about costs. So quick uh, overview of the program. So far year to date, uh, this program serves it, services sixth through 12th grades. Uh, we've done spring break and summer break. We give out the passes during school out times. Uh, we've issued out 532 passes so far this year. And uh, 10th graders had the most passes issued, but you see from that breakdown, it, it's, it's uh, fairly even across the board. Actually, sorry. Yep. Hold on. I always. Where you look at the I know. What what's a pass? Is that a daily pass or is that an annual? Thank you. So it, it's a. There. Sorry. Uh, it's a special pass that um allows the the kids to get in for free. Um, and we basically charge the pass at the, at a discounted youth rate. My question is, is if a tenth grader gets it, is it for the full school year? Oh, sorry, thank you. Um, there's it, there are passes activated only during school out time, so during the breaks. Okay. So they can't they can't come while school's in session. All right, thanks. Um, and that that limitation is mostly based off of funding. Uh, that's where we landed on the twenty five thousand. Um, so, so far this year, year to date, we've had 2,355 visits, uh, by the youth. Eighth graders are the ones that use those passes the most. And like I said, uh, those are only usable during the school out times. Uh, Wednesday, uh, middle of the day tends to be the highest, uh, use time, but, um, we, we see pretty good, uh, pretty good attendance throughout, except on the weekends, because hopefully they're with their families or, or doing something, um, else but you know during those kind of boring weekdays parents are at work you know they they have a place to go uh so here's kind of uh the rundown over the last few years the pandemic threw a, a little bit of a, a curveball for us but you see on this kind of yellowish white line where that trend is steadily uh increasing and going up so as we look at that trend line we can forecast uh pretty easily we were already forecasting this back in 2019 um what we were seeing for for growth and keep in mind that we don't advertise these passes we don't market them we don't put anything out it's just kind of word of mouth through the, through the schools um so in 2022 we've spent about 21,000 of that 25 total we will hit that with fall and, and half of winter break coming up uh we're seeing a 28 percent increase of the passes issued year to year so that's individual kids that have a pass that are able to use it and um, we're projecting for next year about 680 passes will be issued out uh, if that trend continues. At some point, I'm sure there's probably a ceiling, but we haven't seen that yet. 20% uh, increase in the use of passes is what we're uh, forecasting from that trend line. So we're, we're expecting about uh, 30,000 um, forecasted that, that might uh, be more than that. Uh, this year was, was higher than we were expecting. Um, a lot of that is just people are, are back and comfortable uh, coming to the community center again after the pandemic. Uh, so 30,000. So we asked for 75,000 and part of what that funding is going to go toward is to expand how many kids are coming out. So we are going to do a little bit of marketing carefully. Um, just we don't want it to blow up and, and have every youth in the community grab one because that would not be uh, sustainable for us. But we do want to, you know, if if it's going to be a benefit to kids, uh, most of the kids that are are um, aware of this and, and going after it are uh, kids that, uh, um, you know, need need child care services. They they need a, a place to go. Um, uh, counselors try to target uh, kids where they would be of the most benefit. So we want to market that a little more out. Um, look at at limited year round passes, maybe for at certain at risk youth, um, letting them use the passes on times outside of the breaks, um, targeted fitness classes. And we heard from our youth representative in the Parks and Recreation Commission uh, that uh, specifically um, all the girls in the high school really like to do fitness classes together and they want to kind of a safe space where it's just females uh, doing it that that is incredibly popular at the high school and they've asked for more of that and so we're going to work on uh, providing that during those times for um, for the girls that come out uh, we're looking at 
uh, procuring a ninja aquatic course that is as awesome as it sounds. So uh, this is a this is a um, apparatus that hangs above the competition pool. And you know, if you ever seen those, you, you know, American just things, that's what it is. Uh, it's also usable for uh, for adaptive programming, uh, therapeutic recreation as well. Um, TR programming and safe space support is something that we want to include with this as well. Uh, that, that this is a, our first year of really diving in and uh, reaching out to that underserved population, um, several different underserved populations, uh, demographics. Uh, so having that uh, both for, for um, you know, kids that come from a, a Latino family uh, that, that want some of that support, LGBT uh, kids, um, uh, kids with disabilities uh, or have special needs um, and, and develop a lot more inclusive support uh, groups and activities for them. Uh, we'll also be expanding our game room and uh, which has been, we did that this last year and that was a big hit. So moving forward, what, what's possible with this program? Um, one of the things we wanna do is look at expanding access to all students year round. That's, that's a big ask, you know. Um, we're anticipating approximately for 600 students, uh, what we're seeing about right now as of today, um, that'd be about $175,000 a year. So, so maybe there is a, a qual qualifier for that, um, some, some kind of uh, parameter that if a student meets that, then, then they'll get that full year pass, otherwise they get the, the regular um, time off pass. Uh, we're working with local schools to get referrals for students who benefit the most from that. Um, to do an annual membership, we had a, a young man that used his pass every single day. He was there all day. And uh, the staff was so moved by this. We uh, had some of our staff get together and they bought him an annual pass. Um, you know, there, there are some kids that just really love being there. And there's also kids that I think need a place. Um, and that's most telling when we, we close and we have to kind of scoot them along out the door. Uh, so looking at allowing the use of pass on early release uh, Wednesdays and weekends is another uh, way we can expand that uh, use for them. Um, and I have some costs here related to that, but these are things we can talk about in the next budget year. Um, you know, Council's looking at uh, authorizing the appropriation of the 75. I think that's what we can tackle and expansion of these programs. We'll work on some of these ideas. Um, impacts of expanding will be obviously that budget increase. And then also community center use. Um, the kids are pretty hard on our equipment and uh, our facility, but our, our staff is happy to clean up after them and, and work with them. We have a pretty good relationship with the youth in the community. Uh, so a couple ideas through here. And we, again, we can have conversations about this with the Parks and Recreation Commission. Next year when we uh, come to budget season, we'll probably have a, a more dialed in number of what we're actually to take on scope wise and, and have an ask for you uh, for consideration. Um, I told Steve, I try to keep this not too long, so we'll finish up here, but workshops are, are something. Um, and here's some examples of different workshops that we heard when we got feedback from high school students that uh, attended. Um, one of the things, uh, Lego League and uh, Girls Coding was a, a big one that we heard as well. Um, movie nights, uh, Parks and Rec job shadowing is something that I think is a, a benefit both ways, a kind of a little feeder program. We're doing that with, uh, with uh, first aid classes and safety classes and feeding into our lifeguard program. Uh, so teaching them think, you know, maybe they want to be a fitness instructor or, uh, you know, they want to get their, their uh, um, um, babysitter license, uh, babysitter, babysitter certification. That's not right. Uh, they have uh, interest in um, arborists. Uh, I know my girls have somehow gone to green thumb pretty bad through, through school. So there's a lot of kids that are really interested in doing that, especially with the community garden right there. We can do programs with them. Um, arts, athletics, uh, you know, Parent kids that want to serve on uh, or be a part of competitive teams, uh, helping out with city events. We, we see a lot of kids that want to volunteer with that. Uh, gender sp specific fitness classes, like we talked about. Um, intro to cardio balcony. We see a lot of kids using the cardio equipment and the weight equipment. 
but not using it correctly. So to make sure that they don't injure themselves, uh, you know, teaching them how to, to lift weights properly, doing some personal, um, um, some personalized uh, training for those, uh, as well as doing group outings, skiing, snowboarding, uh, working with sunlight on that, um, mountain biking, paddle boarding. Uh, we have a kayak group that is doing trainings at the community center and our white water park, um, partnering with them uh, to, to do some of those types of things, um, expanding athletics and uh, different courses. And then support groups, I think is the, the biggest one, which is really where this program started out with, is how do we help at-risk youth, those, um, those uh, teens that are interested in mental health issues, um, school support, uh, navigating through social experiences and identity, uh, buddy connections, um, all those kind of things I think marry very well with, with what the priorities of the Valley Marijuana Council had for these proceeds. Um, and then doing additional updates to our, our game room. Uh, that was such a big hit. They just about love the equipment to death. So we'll look at how to expand that and um, provide, you know, continue to provide a, a great place where uh, the community center truly lives up to its name and provides a sense of community for the youth, and youth that we have here in Gorman Springs. Paula, any questions? Um, is the... Uh... The, the number of students who are Latino representative of the high school population, like is it's thirty percent. Yeah, I, I would say so. We don't really we don't really gather demographic information from from the kids, but I mean, just you know, if you go there on a on a Wednesday and see who's playing basketball or whatever, yeah, it's pretty repre representative of our our population demographics. And is um, this might be a brand question, but is there? outreach that might be directed toward those families just for, so that they're a little bit more aware of it. It's just yeah, and like I said, that's something that we're looking at is how can we maybe do some specific marketing towards you know what might be underserved populations or families that, you, you know, um, like some of the challenges we're seeing, especially with uh, Latino families, is that the parents are very hesitant to give their information. So they, they don't wanna register for a class. Mm. Uh, they don't want to sign their kids up for a pass because they don't want to put their name and address on anything. Uh, you know, there's kind of this inherent cultural um, trepidation with government in general. And so, so you know, how so go, working with the high schools to develop that relationship with the kids so they know about the program and, and have them help us build that relationship with parents and, and engage in that way. Great. Thank you. Um, Brian, thank you so much. I. I just love this program. I love that how you came up with the idea to spend, you know, to invest in our youth from the marijuana tax funds. I think it's it's great. So thank you so much for developing this. I love the ideas that you have and like for the home life skills. I don't know how you staff all that, you know, especially with our seven. So have you thought of like tapping into, um, you know, how do I say? Uh, vetted in, um, volunteers from the community, either from maybe the, the senior community or other communities that might want to. Yeah, I think there's some great partners, partnerships that, you know, we currently have and are available through ARC, through Youth Zone, through Yampa. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and al along with that, our, our staff are very passionate about youth, especially, especially this, this age group that, you know, we don't normally recreate to, not because we don't want to, they just, it's hard to engage them. Right, you know? right. Older exactly. adults, great, you know, adults, uh, little kids, but that that population, which is going through probably the most difficult times of their, of their life and need yes. that, that sense of community and, you know, um, being able to, to socialize and recreate and, and have those um, good experiences and, me and memories that are most vital are the hardest to, to get to. So, all my staff are more than happy to, you know, double up and and jump into some of these things. Most of most of this list came from our staff just brainstorming. Hey, I would love to do this with with the kids oh, awesome, whatever. Yeah, it's fantastic. Well, I'm excited to see how the seventy five thousand goes for 2023, and you know, let us know what you need and other ideas to expand it. Absolutely. I I just want to jump. Right, Paul. 
turned it off instead of on. I wanted to um, just say a couple of gratitudes. Amanda Madden is our youth representative on Parks and Rec Commission, and she's so, so engaging and, and creative and open to sharing fantastic ideas and just really has a connection to obviously that, that age group. She's a student at GSHS. Um, Brian, thank you. The, I mean, the energy and the patience you had in bringing, I mean, this group in general um, is just I so, so appreciated. And then last is just Christy Newton and her staff um, because they, they are so well, like welcoming and supportive to these kids and they also clean up after them. So, <laughs> So they just make sure that everyone knows how much we appreciate them. Thank Pass you. That on the staff. They appreciate that. Uh, Brian, yeah, I, I appreciate the presentation. It really does help me understand. And I think your your view toward where we need to go is is I think spot on. I, I really want to see us more in that after school concept because there's a lot of like bedroom and latchkey kids and things like that because parents don't have the money or there isn't the resources. So yeah more that we can expand into after school, particularly on Wednesdays when it's so early, I think is, is going to be really important. And I also think that, that outreach to the Latinx community is going to be real critical. I, I That's a significant portion of our population. And um, as you say, you don't have the, the de demographics, but I do think if we can somehow subtly be doing that, that'd be helpful to us understanding the program. So yeah. thank you very much for your work. Yeah. Brian, you said, you know, that story about all the staff pitching in to buy that one member a, uh, a season pass. Do you, do you perceive that cost is a barrier to year round participation, not just in out school times? I think that, you know, we're getting upwards of five or 600 kids signing up for these. It's pretty indicative that there are a lot that, uh, you know, these are kids that don't necessarily um, have passes already. Uh, in fact, I've I would say most of them don't. And so, you know, whatever that barrier is, whether that's a cost barrier or a time barrier or something else, I, I don't know. But we do know that a lot of families, hey, my kid got a free pass. You know, I'm going to sign up to, to go with it. It seems to uh, encourage and give a little bit of uh, financial relief to families that don't want to do that and recreate together. And this is only during out times, right? So spring right. breaks, not after school at all, though, right? Not right now. No. Is there, if we were to, allocate more funds whether from wherever they come from maybe it comes from marijuana maybe it comes from someplace else do you think that either if you scholarship had a scholarship program for some of those kids or just lowered the cost of youth passes specifically like middle school and high school passes that that would be a, a benefit can you even staff that if that yeah, was the so case? So this is an issue, you know, we've already been looking at and working towards solutions for so we do have a scholarship program um, we changed our model for sponsorships for special events. So now when a uh, organization uh, sponsors a special event, you know, we're promoting them, they're sponsoring it, but the <laughs> funds that they give us go into a scholarship that allow kids to, uh, you know, get a, a youth pass for half off or register for a class um, or, or whatever that is. Um, and, and hopefully that will continue to, to grow. Uh, it seems to be very popular now with the businesses that, you know, they love that idea, just not just a special event, but actually making an impact in the life of a, you know, maybe an underprivileged youth is something that they're, they're all behind. And how do we find out if they're underprivileged? I mean, are we asking, I mean, you just said that people don't want to sign up their name. They don't want to, you know, put even their name on a list. Do we, we're not asked, do we do ask anything other than just for them to sign yeah, up? Yeah. So, so when we were originally, um, Doing this, you know, there were some qualifications, you know, just ask for a, a free meal letter and, you know, something like that. We, we don't get into their yeah. finances too much. Okay. Any other questions? Brian, thanks so much. You bet. My pleasure. Jonathan, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, is I'm not asking for myself, but is the Ninja program open for staff? Yeah, well, well. The youth will probably show you how it's done. Give me counsel and staff. John. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Eat water. Tell him. <laughs> Tony has just challenged me. I Ryan. challenged him. And I'll say, I challenged Jonathan. <laughs> that must be televised. Ninja pool thing. Ninja pool thing. Hello, Hannah. Hello. Hannah and I are going to impersonate Trent. 
Are there any questions? I think the memo <laughs> pretty much covers everything. I don't have a lot of questions. Excellent. In all seriousness, uh, we were directed to go back and find a value for this. Um, it seemed like the most logical thing to do was look at the open space dedication requirements in the code, apply that value, uh, discount it for an easement, and spit out a number. That number was roughly 14.7, uh, rounding up to 15,000, uh, which seems pretty reasonable. I mean, seems appropriate given the kind of, of property that it is, and it's what we would charge you know, a developer if they needed to dedicate land to us. Um, the one caveat on that, as we talked through it with um, Chad and, and his clients, uh, is that they would really like to see that money spent on, a, you know, some kind of recreation improvement since it is impacting open space out there in the meadows. With that, open to any questions here. Just clarity, do you mind? Yeah. Uh, so this is basically a, a the funding would pay for an easement. Is that what you're saying yeah, so, not, like so this buying. Is a, yeah this is a um, a subsurface geotech or geograde easement um soil nails essentially um there won't be any surface disturbance um you guys directed us at the last meeting to come back with a value we hadn't put a value in the easement so this is uh, a subsurface easement that impacts the open space out at meadows um so that's why when kind of richard and i looked at it and kicked it around in the office we thought using the open space dedication uh price per square foot, which is about 550 a square foot, and then discounting it like we would see on any easement that we would say do out on South Midland or something like that uh, when we were pay paying for an easement at 50% of the, the value. So that's how we came to the 15,000. Other questions? Okay. Can you do that? Can you like have one other Please question? presentation that we're I just, I just had one quick question on the, and maybe I'm thinking about this wrong, so you can help me understand it a little better, but on the 50% valuation, I guess I, when you look at the site plan, the way that the road curves around, it, it's basically going right close to the property line. So I'm kind of seeing that with the location of that, pushing the road that way and being able to push that that retaining wall to the edge of the property and use the city property, it's really allowing more profitable use of the developer's property. So I, I'm, I, I'm wondering yeah, about I, that discount. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, it's, you know, obviously up to you what you guys want to set that value at. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess when I thought about it, I thought about like any other real estate transaction, which is what's the impact on the fee interests that I hold um, right. representing the owner um, right. rather than necessarily the value um, or perspective value to the to the person wanting to get the easement. And so when I look at the as the fee owner um, and the impact on that property, it's a subsurface easement. Um, it's open space. The, you know, frankly, the likelihood of us developing on top of that is relatively low. Mm -hmm. um, it is, you know, not exclusive. If somebody wanted to walk down onto that, they could. That's kind of where we came to on valuing an easement in terms of just straight up real estate principles, I guess you would say. Okay. You guys obviously can do whatever you want. All right. Thanks. <laughs> That could be dangerous. I, I was going to yeah, say, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Fuck. Any other questions? Questions? No, I was going to make a motion. I was going to open up real quick to yeah. public comment. Is there anybody from the public who would like to speak? Seeing that, I'll bring it back. Actually, there is a motion on the table from the previous meeting. There was a motion to continue that oh, yeah. uh, okay. Charlie yep. had. So the yep. motion was for 5%. I believe there is a motion for a 5%. Um, Deed restriction in consideration for this in perpetuity. And I believe, was there a second? I think Paula had the second. So, uh, seeing how that's still on the table, uh, is there any comments, further comments on that motion? Go ahead, Marco. Just, just real quick, I cannot. Which, I'm sorry, I turned it back off. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of with Shelly on this. I'm not 100% sure how we can actually put a value on this. Um, I understand what you guys did with the real estate um, square footage back and forth parkland dedication, but I'm I'm not 100% sure that 
that's enough value for the people of Glenwood to receive while giving up land. Um, could you clarify what land you're giving up? The one we couldn't build on, even if we wanted to. Um, the one that's zoned open space right, on a hillside that is prohibited from development under your code. Right, but it's still open space. With a and, green, right. So and and I think what I was trying to explain was that this is a subsurface easement. So the surface is still available to the citizens of Glenwood Springs. So, to so use. nothing will poke out? No. This I is a subsurface that. geogrid soil nail easement. It's all sub. I didn't know that. That was okay. my concern. Sorry. I thought I there was stuff it. poking out and I don't know, rebar, what have you. No. So I'm a little bit confused. Go there. Initially, when we spoke about this, I. I mean, to be honest, this was the outcome that I wanted um, because I do feel as though this being a subsurface easement with a, a property designation that we are not going to be able to develop above made it as though, to, to me, I can see that there needed to be some value and I could appreciate initially I was going to be like, just take it because housing is a priority of this council. Mm -hmm. And so in order to get the housing, which they didn't even need to give um, affordable housing because at the time that they applied it, we didn't even have the new code in, at the time. And they did. To me, it felt as though there was a reciprocal balance there that we, you know, we were getting something that we had asked for, which is increased housing and affordable housing designations. And now here this easement was, which they would have never known initially because of our new code not requiring them to do engineering on the front end. This was not through the developer trying to get greedy in the process. You know, the, their number of units didn't change to my understanding from the beginning to the end, but rather they just realized that in order to, um, especially that those soil conditions, they realized that in order to build a safe and, and you know, a road with longevity, they needed to have this easement um, to be able to do a subsurface, um, you know, retaining wall. So for me, to see that we would get some value from it, but it would be, it's significantly lower because really parkland, we cannot develop. And to my understanding, the grade on this would also prohibit us, even if we changed the designation, but I don't believe we have that. It's in our purview to change it. This feels very fair. And, and it's also being appropriated. I mean, at the, a very fair request that it be appropriated to some type of, you know, Brian to Brian and his department's, you know, benefit. What kind of, um, you know, playground equipment can this be used for? Something like that. I see this as a very fair, moderate, in the middle solution to getting housing, and also getting some money towards what the long term goal of this land would be on this on the surface of this land. Go, Charlie. Yeah, I I just. Pull up the motion. The motion says uh, the mayor moves, seconded by Councillor Step, for the BLD development to require 15 units that have already been committed and approved to update to the existing code. I don't think that was the, the end of that motion. I think it's an incorrect statement of the motion. And I think probably had to clarify that for the record. Yeah, I, I actually think what the mayor did is as everybody was exiting, you said 5% forever would be okay with me. <laughs> no, no, I said that that was part of the motion. If we go back to tape, it, it, I wanted it in perpetuity. 15 um, units of perpetuity. That's what I remember. No, 15, 15, 15 units of perpetuity. 15 we units, minutes, not 5%. I missed that until I reread it. Right, so. right. So whether it's 15%, or I'm sorry, whether it's 5% or 15 units, I think same, same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's, I was trying to get that. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to clarify the motion. If, unfortunately, for the minutes, that was, I didn't think of it until I had to go back and look at the motion. I read it, I thought it seemed strange. And then when you said that, I knew we had the motion wrong in the minute. So. Okay. Can you just clarify what the motion is for the record so that we're clear? My, my recollection of the motion was that the existing 15 units that was uh, offered for a period, I believe, a temporary five years, be 10 years, be extended in perpetuity. And that was the value exchange for this easement. Yep. That's my recollection of the motion. Um, Chad, I have a quick question for you. Uh, just a quick question. Okay. <laughs> um, what happens if this easement's not granted? What does that do to the development? What does that do to the road? Is this road able to be constructed if this isn't 
Uh, is a building go away? What what happens? And name in the in the town in which you reside, please. <laughs> Uh, sadly, I, I live in Rome, so, um, yeah, yeah. Um, and thanks for letting me talk. I'll clarify in a second. If you look at page uh, in your staff report, just so everyone understands or we're asking for, it's 87 of the packet. Um, you'll notice on the right side here, there's a profile of, of what we're asking. Um, it's a it's a tiered retaining wall, three steps, mm -hmm. and the bottom retaining wall, uh, because of the slope above the property, requires that these nails, this geogrid material, be in ten and a half feet past the property line. And at that point, it's thirty feet underground, and we will regrade and reclaim ground, and there can be a trail on it. So that's that's what we're asking for. Um, and like like it came up last meeting, it's it's a fairly common ask in our topographically challenged city. Uh, there was an article in the paper just last week about a Western hotel that needed a similar easement, and it quoted Carl and Trent and said how we do these all the time administratively. Um, I'm willing to bet there wasn't much consideration for that just to get the project going. Um, the city needed a lot of these easements when they rebuilt Midland. And there's, there's a calculation of, of what those easements are valued at. Um, and, and those were, as I understand, a lot lower than half the common area. 15%. Yeah, so, so there is an established valuation for this. Yeah, the, the Midland easements, typically on a construction easement like that, um, we pay about 15% of the surface value or of the fee interest value for a construction easement for a similar soil nail on like on the Midland project that we just did. We were we as a city for asking for a similar easement on neighboring properties, we're paying about 15% of fee value. 15? 15, 15, not 15. Of market 15, value. Of talking. market value. And so when the when the engineer drew these initial plans, he left 30 feet from the edge of the roadway to the boundary line. And because of the way the city's process works, um, you get to 100% engineering drawings and the engineer says, oh, wait, because of the slope above this, we need to nail in another 10 and a half feet. So that's why we're here. And can I ask um, Chad to clarify if you had that, the, on what page was it again? 87. 87, so the road itself is actually 30 feet from the property line. Yeah, right? yeah. For that first step in the routine. Um, so, so, and to get to your question. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we, we've scrambled since the last meeting. We thought this was, it was on the consent agenda. We, you know, I thought it was um, going to be a regular request. Uh, we've had an engineer look at alternatives. Um, right now, uh, it would take some extraordinary engineering, um, but would also, um, it would, at this point, the engineer has something that would require extraordinary engineering, um, but still require construction easement across the boundary line. And it would, it would look different than, every other retaining wall on the site. So that's, I mean, that's where we're at right now. So I guess my question is for that consideration of extraordinary engineering relief from you guys is, is 15 units in perpetuity instead of just the 10 years. Is that a fair ask? I don't think so. Um, it's not equivalent value. Uh, we've, we've established a value. I thought the value was more like 15%. Um, Carl convinced me 50%. Is, is a fine ask, um, that's that's fine here. Um, the fact is this this application, and I don't, I don't wanna relitigate this, but um, you know, we have a development code and, and those are the rules. And when, when you file your application, you're subject to those rules. And at that time, there was no affordable housing regulation. And throughout this process, you know, my client offered up uh, 15 units for 10 years. And I think that was, you know, a, a pretty, Pretty good thing to offer. So, I mean, we're willing to pay fifteen thousand um, dollars, which is what staff determined was the value. So, that's where we're at. Okay. Any other questions, Charlie? Can I comment? Uh, I want. Let's. Oh, see if there's anybody just for sake. Anybody from public? Sounds great. Go for it. <laughs> so I guess. 
I think my comments at the time we approved this development were as if they uh, managed up 13 buildings that looked like a bunch of little boxes and I didn't like the development or the style of the development. It looked like they used every inch they could to get all 300 units in and I appreciate Adrian what you said, but I really can't change my viewpoint. I, I think that, you know, and I appreciate that it wasn't discovered because of the way our process works until now, but I still have trouble with it. So I'm probably not gonna vote for an easement for that same reason because I think they maximize the use of the property and uh, I didn't like it then, I don't like it now. Charlie, just as a point of order, would you support the easement if there was an affordable housing consideration given? Okay, Cause that just the, that's the motion yeah, on the no. table. Yeah, I dealt with it. I'm not sure. Okay. I know. Oh, I'm sorry. Turn it off. <laughs> Thanks, Bryce. Go ahead, Tony. Can we call the question? Sure. Mm -hmm. For clarity, this is 15% is the value here. So, in perpetuity, 15 units in perpetuity. Sorry. Not 15%. Is, is what the motion is? Is what the motion on the table currently is? Mm -hmm. Is it's exciting, isn't it, Chad? <laughs> no, Councillor Wusso. Yes, Councillor Step. Yes, Councillor Dem. Yes, Mayor Godis. Yes, Councillor Kaup. No, Mayor Pro Tem Wilman. Yes, Councillor Hershey. It passes five two. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Chad. All right, next item is council comments. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Mr. Wilman has some comments. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, not Mr. Cash, Mr. Yeah, Wilman. Cash. Yes. Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash. Bring up five. Uh, just a couple, um, couple of things. Uh, had a uh, chamber of commerce board meeting this this week and and uh, there was one a couple about a month and a half ago and there were two things going on one is the the uh, part of strawberry days they you may have noticed they limited the strawberry queen competition they decided instead to put money into the youth and so there was a subcommittee which i'm a member let's talk about youth leadership we're going to meet again tomorrow on scholarships so maybe some are trying to get more as Igor mentioned about amanda and the parks uh, more of the uh, young, young people involved in local governmental boards and commissions and and i talked to the free paul freeman today about that and they're very interested the other thing is the the uh there was a presentation. Sorry, Chai, Chai, can I just quote a quick ask? What what are you trying to get more youth? What are they trying to get more youth involved? We're, in? we're real early stage. I'll okay. just let you know what's going on. Yeah, I yeah, don't cool. really have any details. Sorry. Yet. The other thing is there was a presentation made uh, by Katie, and I can't remember last time I had her card, I forgot to bring it with me, of the Child Care Coalition. And there are multi jurisdictional coalitions looking at maybe creating a special district and, and taxing to, to create more uh, preschool and or child care opportunities for pre-kindergarten uh, children. And they're, they're probably gonna wanna approach the council at some point and make a presentation. I don't think they approach you yet or not, Steve, I know that, but I know it's something they're looking at it. They're looking at maybe next year at election or maybe uh, two years from now, that's not clear. Yeah, thank you. Other comments, Shelly. I have a couple of comments. The first one has to do with trailheads um and i know we're getting at the end of the trail kind of more the busy season at our trailheads but on um for the doc holiday trail which is off of bennett there there there's there's it's a busy trailhead <laughs> and there's not a you know we don't really have trailhead parking there there's a little bit on 12th street on the shoulder but everything else is on the residential street um, so I've had comments from neighbors. When you go up 13th Street, it if you take a right, you're going to a cul-de-sac on Bennett. If you go straight, you're you're basically two driveways. There's a little old sign at the top of 13th and Bennett that mm -hmm. is one of the historic Brown River Trail signs, and it has a it has an arrow that says Trailhead. 
Doc Holiday Trailhead that way. Nobody sees it, so they get a lot of traffic up those driveways into that neighborhood there. They've put up their own cardboard sign that says not the trailhead here, but they would really appreciate a like street style traffic yellow sign that people can see that says, you know, not trailhead exit or, or trailhead half, half a block north, something like that, that would actually people would see and direct them that way. So that's my first one on the trails. The second one is I'd really like to see if we could consider having porta potty facilities at that trailhead for the summer next 2023, and then also possibly at the Knight Street trailhead for Red Mountain, you know, those two locations. It, I, that's fantastic. Yeah, there's just enough traffic there to really warrant it. And that that's great. Otherwise, go to Shelly's house and use hers. Otherwise, they go <laughs> for the front yard. Um, so the other comment I had is I had a conversation with Dan Blankenship about uh, RAFTA is really moving forward with expansion of bike share. It's part of their 2040 plan, and but expanding bike share uh, in 2023, 2024 to Carbondale and Glenwood respectively. So they're looking at getting an MOU signed for the different communities for recycle. And it's on a pretty quick schedule, primarily because of all the supply chain issues, um, ordering docking stations and bikes and all that is, is a very long lead time. So they're looking at having to order in early 2023 for, for Glenwood to do it in 2024. So that means we're, we might be on an accelerated schedule with council to kind of make a decision on that. And Dan asked me how, you know, how me, we might work to get there. So I just wanted to get council's kind of head nod. And I talked to Ingrid about this today is that it seems to me the best process might be to run it through the transportation commission and have them bring a recommendation on bike share in Glenwood back to this council and possibly talk to FAB about where's the money gonna come from long-term. RAFTA has secured grant funds that will pay for 50% for our first three years. But after that, the city will be picking up more of the tab, I believe. So, so I think that the ask um, for us is how do we get there on whether or not this council is ready to say, yes, let's go forward with bike share. And it seems like a good process was to really ramp up education for our transportation commission and this council. So if that sounds good, I will pass that on to staff. And That's not a private company that usually does. Recycle is a private company yeah. that contracts with RAFTA and they've done the Aspen program in Basal right. now. Mm -hmm. the same time. Christian, has, has the DDA looked a little bit at bike sharing? Is, do I remember that correctly? Or do I, my we had a presentation one time about it, but I haven't heard much since. It just okay. might be something we'd want to talk to the DDA about as far as again, they'll be fun to do a lot of stuff, but maybe, but again, maybe, maybe there would be something they could they could do. So, so I'll put them on the list yeah. too for okay. Thanks. Any other comments? Thanks, Shelly. Shelly or Paula. Oh. Um this kind of is directed at staff as well, but I've had a couple of different neighborhood people reach out to me from different neighborhoods in my ward. And um, big picture is they wonder about traffic calming. And um, I have done some internal communication with staff on a particular neighborhood, but I'm almost wondering if in the next, uh, some kind of PR campaign on how much traffic calming budget there is, how do you apply for it? What kind of, just something that we can kind of get out into the public on how we do that and um, when they can kind of come forward and request that kind of information because I'm I'm kind of doing it as a one-off, but it does feel like the transportation committee does have this every year, and and for the general public public just to understand accessing that information and and when they can do it for their neighborhood. And on that note, I had mentioned a couple of meetings ago about doing neighborhood meetings, um, and in particular, I'm again thinking of that. Um, Triumph, Bell Rippy, mm -hmm. Four Point, I don't even know who it is anymore, um, is 
pretty is going to be opening its doors, I think October, right? And feedback from again, my ward is like, what's going on? When is that? What about the one way street? How long is that going to happen? People just don't know because they aren't as immersed in these things as we are. So if we could have these neighborhood meetings or something along that line that, you know, I don't mind handing out flyers or information mm -hmm. or something that people can get together and ask their questions, that'd be great. Thanks. Let's see an election coming up soon. Uh, Ingrid, <laughs> sorry. I, uh, nope, never mind. <laughs> okay. no, I, I'm just going to let Paula know that there's a $50,000 line item in traffic calming that the Transportation Commission can appropriate in wherever they feel like they want to right yeah. and i knew that okay but i'm just saying we need to get our community yeah, out absolutely so they know that that's great thank you yeah. um i want to first thank shelly who's covered for me for the last two raft of board meetings i've been out of town both times and so i really appreciate you filling in and bringing that information back, back to both me and the council um it's hugely important uh also and ryan and i were trying to reconstruct how this did or didn't happen but i don't think it actually happened <laughs> at the end of the day there is a um so the thompson divide we're all familiar with thompson divide this council previous councils i think every council we've had you know, carl fact check me for the last 10 years to take unanimous support of keeping thompson divide um in the ranching recreational um historical use and not um and imposing uh expansion into gas exploration uh, right now, there's an administrative action. I'm sorry, there's a request for the administrative withdrawal um, by Senators Bennett and Hickenlooper of the Biden administration, and that would withdrawal would be a 20 year timeout. It wouldn't be in permanent uh, or perpetuity. But um, I got a call from the Wilderness Society today to see if we as a council would write a letter. And so when I say we, I don't have a letter, I don't have verbiage in front of us, but it just reaffirms our position that we want to keep Thompson Divide um, wild wilderness into the ranching, recreational, hunting um, category that we've always affirmed in the past. And so uh, if you would give me the ability to sign that letter on behalf of this council and maybe have Carl draft it, because there's a time, uh, we don't have, we don't have a, it's a th five Thursday, September so it would be too late to get it in if we do it at our next meeting. So that's the only reason we don't have a draft in front of us. And your name wouldn't go on it, Toby. Is it acceptable for me to say from the council of Glen Springs? Since that, well, that would be the vote. From the council of Glen Springs. my name. Okay. Yeah, that's why I was using the council. Thank you. Yes. Would there be a motion for that? Also moved. Second. Been moved by Councilor Cap, seconded by Councilor Dame. I'm sorry, real quick question. So it would be not to allow any recreation or? Oh, no, 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 bring that down. Sorry. Oh, sorry, wouldn't, and wouldn't, wouldn't allow any recreation? No, I'm sorry, it, it, the, the use that it currently enjoys, which is ranching, recreation, hunting, climbing, biking, the whole, that is the continued use. The exclusion, the administrative withdrawal would be the gas leases okay. that would be withdrawn for 20 years. Uh, been moved and seconded. Uh, Ryan, let's call the question. I know, I wanna comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm always a little hesitant to put my name on something that I have not actually read. So if you want to send it to all of us, and if we, if that. we object to, you know, not having and, and moving forward, <coughs> sorry, within a small amount of time, that's good with me. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. And Carl, I think we've written this letter in some form or, or another, a number of times in the past, not yeah. this specific one, not but this specific letter, I will try to get something circulated probably on Monday. Um, I don't know if I'll get to it tomorrow or not. Yeah, and, and I would, if there's something that's a, a deal breaker in there, that would be great. And I apologize. I thought the letter you were referring to earlier was the BLM letter of support that we sent to Hick and Looper and Bennett. So, oh, yeah. okay. all right. All right. So, reboting? Yes. Yes, Councilor Wusso. Yes, Councilor Stepp. Yes, Councilor Dem. Yes, Mayor Gotas. Yes, Councilor Kaup. Yes, Mayor Pro Tem Wilman. Abstain, Councilor Hershey. Passes 6 1. Actually, six. It's so unanimous. Did you abstain? That's a no. That's a no. It's a no. 
No, that's a yes. It's a yes. Okay. Oh, it's a yes? Yeah. It's under, it's under, it's under the yeah. charter, it's a yes. That's why I wanted to be super clear. Okay. City manager. No, thanks. I'm good. Thank you. All right. Um, yesterday, I sent out a memo. I had some questions regarding um, the STB decision to allow uh, for the construction of about 85 miles of rail in Utah to allow the shipment of waxy crude oil um, from Utah and then using the tracks, the UP tracks that run through Glenwood Springs and the Glenwood Canyon. Uh, I've had uh, questions from a couple of council members um, after the Colorado Sun article, um, uh, if there was anything we could do about that. Um, Eagle County is currently appealing the STB decision and that goes to the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, Opening briefs have been filed, um, but there is an opportunity uh, in talking to counsel for Eagle County. Uh, if you wanted to participate to file leave to file an amicus brief, uh, which is basically a friend of the court brief in support of and to flush out some of the concerns regarding um, transport of that along the Colorado River. Um, we reached out to uh, an appellate attorney that we're familiar with in DC that does public interest law work. Uh, Bill Eubanks, you saw in the memo a little bit of information regarding his firm and the work that he has done. Uh, he put a number on that somewhere between probably fifteen and twenty-five thousand dollars to draft that brief. Part of the reason um, the cost might be slightly higher is that we're going to be under. If you choose to do it, we're going to be under a tight time frame to get it done, probably by October twenty-eighth. Uh, four weeks to come up to speed on the you know on the nuances of the case and get a brief filed is relatively short. Um, so with that, I'm looking for direction and or a motion from council as to how you'd like to proceed on that matter. Paul? Can I make a motion to move forward? I'll make a motion that you move forward and um, work with this company to do the amicus brief. I'll second that. Up to 30, Councilor Wusso, is that a friendly amendment? Yeah, okay. I was asking if we could put a cap on how much was being spent, but I heard Shelly throw out a number. I would say up to 30,000. It's just a. Yes, I'll include that. Okay. A cap not to exceed 30,000. I have a question. Go ahead. Carl, it, you know, we talked about the environmental concerns along the Colorado River and everything. What about, can we also explore economic concerns for Glenwood Springs just because we just. We invested $8 million. In yeah, no, and, and we'll we'll be taking a look at a number of those things, recognizing this is really, um, this is an appeal underneath the EIS and NEPA processes. So we are somewhat constrained okay. by those, you know, by the, the issues that what should have been addressed, um, which is one of the real problems with the STB ruling is that they simply, they looked at the 83 miles and ignored the other thousand. Right. Um, <laughs> and what impacts it would have. environmental. And you know, and one of the interesting things is that in the, I believe in the STB ruling, they acknowledged that there would be at least one accident annually involving train cars. And wow. that the scope of this is 18 miles of cars a day will pass through. Un so. Unbelievable, yeah. Okay. Charlie. Two quick questions. Uh, does this come out of your budget? To what, where does the money come from? Um, it, I don't know if we're going to be under enough in my budget. We could also use some of the reserves that we have set aside for the um, uh, RMI litigation. Second question, is there any, any uh, thought of reach out to Robert Cheesley, the CML uh, attorney, and see if CML would be interested in- Yeah, we are. We, um, that's part of, um, if you guys authorize us moving forward, the next step um, is to look at other um, similarly situated communities that might want to, to join in that amicus brief um, and also share the costs in that. Uh, we're a little concerned about the speed with which we need to move. That's the only thing, um, you know, when I think about um, similarly situated communities, they're really here in Garfield, um, Grand and Eagle counties. Um, you know, I, I, my firm represents a number of those entities. So we're going to have those conversations starting tomorrow. Just call Bob and see. Right? Yeah. We were seeing the same Yeah. Any other comments? Ryan, let's call the question. Uh, you moved and Shelly seconded. Sorry, I should have uh, specified. Yes, Councillor Wusso. Yes, Councillor Sepp. Yes, Councillor Dem. Yes, Mayor Godis. Yes, Councillor Kaup. Yes, Mayor Pro Tem Wilman. Abstain, Councillor Hershey. It's unanimous 7 0.
Thanks so much, Carl. That's it. Okay. No correspondence incoming or outgoing. Okay. Uh, we'll adjourn out of regular session and move into, ex I'm sorry, we'll not adjourn. We'll move into executive session. And oh, just let me finish real quick. Um, we will conclude the meeting at the end of the executive session. So anybody who's waiting, all you're going to have. Yes, you can. Yeah. Um, and then we'll maybe take a three minute break. So we clear the room and. Can we make the motion? Can we make the motion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to. Uh, Number one, adjourn at the conclusion of the executive session, but number two, to go into the executive session pursuant to Colorado Revised Statute 246402-4FI regarding personnel matters, which no employee of the city of Glenwood Springs has requested be an open meeting, more specifically regarding the city manager search. Is there a second? Been moved by Councilor Hershey, second by Councilor Dane. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh,